It's called the line because it's linear. A 110 mile network of smart cities. It will be free of roads, cars, and carbon emissions. It will be housed in a single building in Saudi Arabia. It will be $500 billion, probably more. Pop that zinc tablet and hoard that toilet paper recappers. We'll soon unpack a sweeping COVID retrospective from the fine folks at Esri. It's a brilliant post-game analysis of GIS's role during the pandemic and most assuredly in future ones. But there's no mapping that story without first charting an 1800s breakthrough that permanently altered public health through, well, geographic information and systems. John Snow's Colerum. So, in the sweltering summer of 1854, London's Soho district became the epicenter of a deadly mystery. Cholera, the infamous Blue Death, swept through the crowded streets, thickening blood, depriving oxygen, and claiming lives with haunting velocity. As panic gripped the city, one bloke stood apart from the chaos, armed with nothing but intellect and an unconventional approach to solving the puzzle. Dr. John Snow, who John Sands the H wishes he was, an anesthesiologist by trade rejected the prevailing miasma theory, which blamed air for the disease's spread. Instead, he turned to the power of spatial analysis and data visualization to unravel the truth. With meticulous precision from the surveying of one C.F. Cheffins, Snow mapped the outbreak, creating what would become one of the most influential infographics in medical history. Each cholera death birthed a dot on his hand-drawn map, a grim constellation that slowly revealed a pattern. As the dots clustered around a single point, the Broad Street water pump, Snow's suspicions crystallized. He had pinpointed the source of the outbreak, not through microscopes or test tubes, but through deft use of geospatial data. Snow's map wasn't just a static image. It was a dynamic tool that allowed him to see relationships invisible to the naked eye. By overlaying death locations with water sources, he created a primitive, yet powerful, geographic information system. Decades before the term would be coined, with his map and copious evidence, Snow battled skeptical authorities. In a dramatic showdown, he convinced officials to remove the pump handle, effectively cutting off the contaminated water supply. The epidemic's decline thereafter was a testament to the power of spatial thinking. Snow's work laid the foundation for modern epidemiology and showcased the potential of rigorous data collection, geospatial analysis, and visualization. His story is a clarion call to innovators. Harness spatial data, and you just may help mitigate or defeat grand challenges of our time. One snow changed the fate of Westeros. The other changed the fate of public health. Guess which one truly mattered. So, what's capping in this week? GIS steadies pandemic mayhem, the world needs minerals so mines need slam drones, the Middle East wants to build insane stuff and robots might allow it, digital twins lighten the load of stroke recovery, and an AEC air of the week of a football stadium's personal foul, roughing itself, automatic, fall down. Hit those show notes for some quick caps with Apple Vision Pro saying enter virtual Sandman and getting immersive with Metallica, drone news galore, digital twins and employers GLP-1 costs, North American BIM trends, the Matthew Bird podcast, who the hell is that? Hope he lands at his feet. And how photogrammetry and 3D printing recreated the face of a 2,000-year-old Kimmeridge woman. And with that, recap number one. COVID had no roadmap. GIS helped draw one and is ready to again. Humans detest lack of control. Some theorize it's the psychological core of why airports drive us mad. Reactance theory and control aversion. Check them out. Now add to that a lethal virus, inflation, mass confusion, kids learning from home, and the horror that was Zoom stand-up comedy, and you have a civilization salivating for simple, real knowledge. GIS didn't merely provide that. It produced a semblance of stability and control, collective sanity, health, and even camaraderie, as illuminated in a recent Esri blog post that tested positive for breadth, depth, and excellence. From the earliest days of the outbreak, GIS helped visualize the virus's spread while optimizing resource allocation. Dashboards like Johns Hopkins' COVID-19 tracker became essential for governments, researchers, and the public, offering real-time insights into case numbers and policy impacts. Shouts out to ArcGIS and WHO CDC data. Penn Medicine's predictive healthcare team was practically a soothsayer for hospitalization projections after launching CHIME, that's COVID-19 Hospital Impact Model for Epidemics. Furthermore, on the hospital front, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers used GIS to identify alternative care sites and convert them into additional hospital bed capacity. 
while optimizing resource allocation. Dashboards like Johns Hopkins COVID-19 Tracker became essential for governments, researchers, and the public, offering real-time insights into case numbers and policy impacts. Shouts out to ArcGIS and WHO CDC data. Penn Medicine's predictive healthcare team was practically a soothsayer for hospitalization projections after launching CHIME, COVID-19 Hospital Impact Model for Epidemics. More on the hospital front, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers used GIS to identify alternative care sites and convert them into additional hospital bed capacity. Organizations like Direct Relief utilized GIS to identify areas with the greatest need for medical supplies and track supply chains effectively. GIS was also instrumental in testing site mapping, as GIS Corps created a national map of over 70,000 COVID test sites. Then you got contact tracing. GIS linked known cases with potential exposures complemented by wastewater analysis and location data analysis, as demoed by Colorado's Tri-County Health Department. GIS also fueled economic recovery through tools like Kentucky's COVID-19 Economic Impact Dashboard to map unemployment and vulnerability, facilitating virtual business site visits for targeted relief. It also helped vulnerable populations by allowing schools to map Wi-Fi hotspots for remote learners and organizations to create resource maps for essential services like food distribution sites and hygiene stations. Can geographic information be any more valuable? These tools and the pandemic that necessitated them aren't about to be forgotten either, given the ongoings of measles, mpox, bird flu, and whatever else down the pipeline will be the subject of a Bill Gates TED Talk. Don't touch your faces, people, and if you do, be sure to touch tech later. Or this. Recap number two. Simultaneous laxing and mining. Slam drones, critical minerals, and mining's paradigm shift. There's an old joke. Something, something, a miner goes to work with zero risk of any kind. That's, that's it. That's the joke. Thank you. Now, beyond mining danger, Life in 25 is built on what's beneath our feet. From the lithium powering electric vehicles to the rare earth elements in our smartphones, Critical minerals are the invisible foundation of the digital age. Yet, extracting these resources has always been high stakes. Risky, laborious, dirty, and increasingly pressing as global demand surges. Now, mining is getting a co-pilot, with a trajectory beautifully mapped by retired U.S. Air Force Colonel Don Zoldi in a publication for Inside Unmanned Systems. Zoldi explains how 2021 Uncle Sam initiatives on supply chains and minerals, like the bipartisan infrastructure law, served as liftoff. Subsequently, Companies like Exxon Technologies, Amescent, Flyability, Automap, and Carlson have landed us where we are, a slam dunk of safety, efficiency, and data. Because slam-equipped drones, simultaneous localization and mapping, can craft 3D maps of mines while localizing the vehicle in said map, beyond visual line of sight, even in GPS-denied caverns, all while human hazard exposure is next to zilch. As for cost efficiency, Drone inspections and mines save dough like a canary with a life insurance policy. Zoldi cites a founder who estimates his mine customers give between a hundred and ten thousand x return in value, due to the data quality collected and the speed at which it occurs. In emergencies, drones are godsends, rapidly assessing mine collapses and other incidents, providing critical response intelligence. For example, drones were used to map a mine collapse in Africa within minutes, revealing the extent of the damage, how many levels had collapsed and guiding rescue strategies. As Don Zoldi proclaims, mines are vital to the U.S. economy. It's time drones are regarded as vital to mines. Recap number three, Dune Droids, the Middle East ambitious construction and how robots may help achieve it. It's called The Line because it's linear, a 110 mile network of smart cities. It will be free of roads, cars, and carbon emissions. It will be housed in a single building in Saudi Arabia. It will be $500 billion probably more. And yet it's anything but a one-off for a region obsessed with building bigger, better, and more creatively, from Neom and the Red Sea Project to Kadia. But that presents a litany of challenges. Labor shortages, budget bleeding, nail-biting timelines, safety assurance, and extreme weather unique to the Middle East. Well, human challenges anyway. If the Middle East's lofty visions are obstacle-riddled, the closest thing to a panacea might be the robot. Were you to ask Telmo Perez, Innovation Director at Global Conglomerate at Chiona. Perez, transparently citing his organization's extensive robot use for a 149 million euro hospital project, just presented a flurry of similar robotic applications on construction business news, and each could satisfy Middle Eastern aspirations to be the region of the future. 
The convergence of technologies like machine vision, AI, IoT, and 5G enables robots to perform specialized tasks with astounding precision. Take brick lane robots and autonomous excavators, or spot a Boston Dynamics with its prowess for intricate all-terrain site inspections. 3D printing robots build complex structures faster and cheaper with concrete and sustainable materials. This is a steroid of efficiency for the audacious design many Gulf state firms treasure. Robotics can also address regional challenges such as extreme weather, labor, and sustainability goals by using drones for monitoring, automating tasks like rebar tying, reducing waste, and optimizing energy consumption. If there's any place where robotics for construction will have its chat GBT moment, it might as well be the same region that practically built mathematics and is now building with such futurism, you'd have thunk James Cameron just began moonlighting as a real estate tycoon. And what wisdom such a blueprint would impart for firms from Denver to Dubai. Recap number four, PT, meet DT, digital twins and supercharged stroke recoveries. Two seconds. That's all that elapses in this planet between human A having a stroke and human B. For many survivors, regaining mobility is daunting. Muscle weakness, coordination loss, and imbalance have long spelled multi-year rehab. Researchers at the Technical University of Munich, however, are putting recovery on the Autobahn with a quartet of tech and digital twins at the core. As explained on Medical Express, their new system helps patients learn to move paralyzed arms and hands quickly after a stroke, often at home and without others. It's the culmination of a supportive exoskeleton, functional electrical stimulation, FES, and a colored flying ball computer game feeding into a digital twin. So, the FES component targets specific forearm muscles to enable actions like finger movement, object grasping, and catching. Since paralysis after a stroke often affects an entire side of the body, the system includes a scaffold to support the arm up to the shoulder. The digital twin tech records patient-specific data, such as muscle activity and stimulation strength, to create a personalized control loop. This ensures individualized support for arm and hand movements based on each patient's capabilities and needs. The exoskeleton integrates seamlessly with FES, supporting the arm and shoulder while working in conjunction with electrical stimulation to facilitate movement. It is designed for, quote, intention-controlled intelligent control, allowing patients to move as much as they are able. Patients then rehab through an interactive computer game where they catch colored balls on a screen and match them with color-coded boxes. The game dynamically adapts to each patient's abilities, encouraging active engagement in therapy and further informing their recovery twin. This system has been tested on 24 stroke patients to stellar results. The algorithmic precision enables therapists and patients to know the exact ideal intensity of movement. Not too much, not too little, just right. Fitting motto for any digital twin if you think about it. Okay, recappers, the time's come for your AEC Air of the Week. Seattle, 1987. Grunge music is a local newborn. Coffee shops are multiplying like rabbits that survived a nuclear apocalypse, and the University of Washington is dreaming big. It's expanding Husky Stadium, adding 13,700 seats to become an exemplar of the college football experience. February 25th. In a real metamorphosis, 250 tons of steel went from a promising stadium addition into the world's largest, most expensive game of pickup sticks. In 12 seconds, the North Bleachers collapsed into a twisted metal sculpture that no art major could explain. The culprit? A premature farewell party for six out of nine guy lines, those unsung heroes of construction and tension that keep structures from doing the cha-cha in the wind. It was like removing a tightrope walker's safety net mid-performance, except this acrobat weighed a half million pounds. But wait, this tale has more twists than Tom Brady down 28 to 3. Just moments before the collapse, an eagle-eyed iron worker spotted a buckle in a 28-inch diameter tube. Faster than you can say structural integrity, Supervisor Wally Sharp evacuated the site, potentially saving the lives of 40 workers. Then, in a stroke of millisecond serendipity, photographer John Stamets happened to be cycling by. With cat-like reflexes, he captured the entire collapse in 21 heart-stopping frames. It was like the world's most expensive flipbook, each image worth more than a thousand words and probably a few thousand bucks in repair costs. Reality Capture would have swiftly captured precise measurements and forged picturesque models, detecting the early signs of structural strain long before the first catastrophic buckle. Drones' aerial agility, that spotting of weaknesses from angles no human could access? Invaluable. But today's advancements go beyond simple detection. 
Robots could have been deployed to conduct automated inspections, making detailed analyses of joints and beams without risking human lives. Digital twins, virtual replicas of the stadium, would have simulated every possible failure scenario, from minor stress cracks to complete structural failure, predicting the collapse down to the last detail. Knowing it wasn't ideal to remove those guy lines? <laughs> That's quality BIM formation. Better yet, these technologies would have been interconnected in an integrated platform, providing a holistic view of Husky Stadium's health as if it had its own digital pulse. Nevertheless, instead, reality unfolded differently. Husky Stadium collapsed for reasons still viable today, you know, like human error. So remember, folks, the best way to not fumble is to have the best playbook. In AEC, that's one filled with technology. Later, recappers. Thank you all so much for advancing innovation. Check out those show notes for those quick caps. And if you prefer emailed recaps, happy capturing, like, and subscribe to always know what's happening, who's driving it, and the history behind it.